Welcome to Section 5.5 AP Calculus, um, which is going to be a, a very mechanical section. There's going to be a lot less time spent thinking once we once we uh, get the hang of this on what I often refer to as shoe tying. First few times you tied your shoe is pretty tough. We don't think about it anymore, and that's what, that's what this needs to become. Just mechanics, quite a shift from 5.4 and uh, quite a shift from where we're heading with this stuff into 5.6. So let's master these mechanics. The first thing we're going to talk about, I'm going to, I'm going to piece this into to basically three different lessons. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to talk about linearization. We're going to go straight to the linearization type problems. So if f is differentiable at x equals a, then the approximating function L of x is f of a plus f prime a times x minus a. This is called linearization for a reason. Take a look at this for a second. If, if I was to subtract f of a on both sides and get this. Let's piece this together a little bit. A function turns x's into y's. So this is a y value minus a y value equals the derivative of a function is a slope, a slope times an x value minus an x value. Oh, this is really just point slope form for the most part. What's happening here, this is kind of a good one to talk about if we were, let's say we were dealing with y equals square root of x. So a quick sloppy little representation of that. And on this function somewhere we've got the point, um, I'm just going to jump over here and call this 1, 1. We know put in 1, get out 1. And let's say we want to find a point, this, the square root of, what's the square root of, one, whoops, sorry, square root of 1.2. Well, I don't know that off the top of my head like I know that the square root of 1 is 1. So let's say 1.2 is right here. What, we know it's close to 1, so we're going to use that as our approximation, as our center of our linearization, it's called. And what, what this actually does for us is it basically puts us on this point this point, it puts us on this point, and then it says, let's travel point 2 in an x direction away from it. That's what this does. Let's travel point 2 away from 1, and let's travel along the tangent line. So the value I would end up getting would be slightly above the actual value. And if I choose, a, if, if, if 1 is close enough to, the, to this value, then we get a really close approximation. This would be a lousy center of the approximation if I was trying to find the square root of 96.3. But because we know the square root of 1. So for instance, if I was trying to find what's a good approximation for the square root of 67, then I would jump to the point 64.8, and I would, I would use this process there. So basically, we're jumping on board a tangent line that's getting us close to the slope's changing, gets us close, but in this case, gets a little, little bit above. So this, that's why it's called an approximating function. So let's take a look at some examples of that. The first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this function when I get to those. So example one, find the linearization. So L of x equals a is our big player. It is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a. And then we're going to state um, how accurate is the approximation. Um, and we're going to be, you can see here, we are moving 0.1 unit down the road. This will travel 0.1 unit down the road along the tangent line, this will give us our actual value and we're going to want to know, hey, how, how good is that as an approximation? So things we need. We need f of 2. That's f of a. So f of 2 is 2 cubed minus 2 times 2 plus 3 or 8 minus 4, 4 plus 3, 7. We need our derivative function, so that's f prime of x is 3x squared minus 2, and we need that so we can find f prime of a, or f prime of 2. So that is 3 times 2 squared minus 2, that's 12 minus 2, or 10. So L of x is f of 2, f of 2, 7, plus 
f prime of 2, 10, times x minus a, a is 2. So L of x is 10x, I get 7 minus 20 minus 13. So that is my approximate, that's my that will give me approximate values provided that we're reasonably close to 2. Okay, so what we want to do now is find how good my approximation is, how nice of a job this is done. I want to find L of, the actual L of 2.1. L of 2.1 is 10 times 2.1 minus 13, or we get 21 minus 13, exactly 8. And then we're going to find the real f of 2.1, and I'm going to use my calculator for that. And let's clear out of that, clear this. So I want, this down a little bit here, get myself organized where we can see everything. I want 2.1 to the third, 2.1, nope, yep, 2.1 to the third, didn't want that. Fumble a little bit here. 2.1 to the third minus 2 times 2.1 plus 3. And I get that, that, that equals 8.061. So how good is my approximation? Well, it's 0 .061 away. But there's a, there's a strict way we're going to answer this. We want to find the difference of these two numbers. So you can set that up as the absolute value of 8 minus this, or just always choose the bigger number first. But our error is 0 .061. And we could write that as... 6.1 times 10 to the negative second. Therefore, we will say our error is within 10 to the negative first, or 0.1, because 0.1, we're still OK by this decimal place. We're still exactly right by this decimal place. So it's always one more than that, that index number. Okay, So 8 matched by the first decimal place, it's still a match, and then we're off. So within 0.1, we know we're, our, our error is within that. Okay, all right, so number, or letter B, I want f of 1, that is 1 plus 1 on 1 or 2. I want f prime of x, that is 1, Derivative of x to the negative first is negative x to the negative second, so that's 1 on x squared. I want f prime of 1, which is 1 minus 1 on 1 squared, or 0. This is going to present about kind of a peculiar uh, rarity that, that happens on these. It's going to have a, we're going to have a little different look to this. So I've got my linearization model. L of x is f of 1, 2 plus the derivative 0, and no, I'd stop there normally, but I'm going to go ahead and then say x minus 1, or L of x is 2. So kind of a weird one, but we must be kind of at a flat point on the curve on this. Some interesting things are going on there. So I want to know what is my approximation at 1 plus 0.1, or 1.1. Well, our approximation is it's going to be 2 there. I don't think that's going to be accurate, um, but it's going to have some degree of accuracy, hopefully. Let's find f of 1.1. That is 1.1 plus 1 on 1.1. So, back to this guy. 1.1 plus 1 divided by 1.1 is 2.009, and truthfully, that's about all I need is approximately 2.009, if you like, I'm going to put, I'm going to round that. This guy was equal to 2. So our error is approximately 0 0.0091, but to, to answer the question, we're going to say our error is within, see it's accurate here, it's accurate here. So we're within 10 to the negative second. All right, one more. Just mechanical. 
I want to know what f of pi is. I want to know what tangent of pi is. Well, tangent of pi is 0. We're going to double check our calculators to make sure we're in radians. Um, I want to know what the first derivative is of tangent of x. That is secant squared of x. I want to know what the first derivative is at pi. That is secant squared of pi. Well, cosine of pi is negative 1. So this is the reciprocal of negative 1, negative 1 times negative 1, positive 1. So my linearization equation is L of x equals, we start at 0, we add to that, our slope is 1, times pi plus 0.1. Oops, I'm sorry. Hang on for a second. That's a mistake. It's my fault. 0 plus 1 times x minus our, our a value, x minus pi. Sorry. L of x is that, or L of x is just x minus pi. OK, my apologies there. All right, now I want to find that for pi plus 0.1. That's, again, that's what we're doing up here. A is pi. I want to find L of pi plus 0.1. So I'm not going to approximate that. L of pi plus 0.1 is pi plus 0.1 minus pi, or 0.1. Let's find out what f of pi plus 0.1 is. And I'm going to do that on my calculator. So that would be, make sure we're in radians. We are. I've got tangent of pi plus 0.1, and I get 0 0.10033, 3, on, on, on. So if I was to subtract those, take a look at my approximation right here. If I was to subtract those, I'd get 0 0.00033. So in other words, we're good, we're good, we're still good here, and now we're bad, so we're good to this place. That is 10 to the negative first, second, third. So our error is within 10 to the negative third. Not too bad. OK, then our next bit of mechanics is Newton's method. And uh, as I mentioned in class, this is going to be a, you need to give your calculator a giant hug for this one, because even with a calculator, keypad calculator, where you, you had your basic operations, this is quite a process, quite a process involved on, on this. Um, our calculator is going to be awesome, and that, that is described here, uh, what we're going to end up doing on our calculator. But here's a little bit about Newton's method. What Newton's method does for us, let's say we've got a function looks something like this. What Newton's method says, and let's say this is somewhere between 1 and 2. Newton's method says, if we can have an estimate of where a 0 might be, so in this case it's close to 1.5, you might say 1.4, 1.3. Um, what it does is it basically puts us on the graph. It's a lot like the linearization problem. It puts us on the graph. That's not a 0. And then it tries to... It tries to approximate zeros by throwing it along the tangent line. So along the tangent line, this would get thrown this far. It would match up here, and then we get thrown back. We go through iterations. This is a, a recursive definition. So in other words, we choose a value for x, maybe 1.5. I go through this process, and I get a new one. Let's say my new one is 1.2. Then I put 1.2 here, and I find f of 1.2 and f prime of 1.2. And I get a new x value. And the more we do this, the more our, our values, if we choose a value close to the 0, the more they're going to close in uh, on the actual 0. Now, the problem with Newton's method, and it's awesome, is let's say, let's say I was looking at the sine curve. And I was trying to find this 0, but I chose a value here. It would try to throw us maybe way down, the, maybe n never even hitting another zero, or maybe way down the road till I get another zero as sine continues on, and then I don't get the zero I'm looking for. So again, we, we need to choose reasonable values that are close. 
and then go through the process that's described here that I'm going to show you on the on your calculator. Okay, so here's our formula. First thing I'm going to do is write that formula down when we look at Newton's method. So we get xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of x on f prime of x. And here is how we're going to handle that guy. I'm going to, well, you know what, first I'm going to go ahead and just, because what if we didn't even have a graphing calculator with us? What would the process be? Well, let's talk about this graph for a minute. I know that this graph wants to start at negative 1. When x is 0, we're down here. And I know that it passes a baton to x, and x is, has a slope of 1. The next thing we want is we want to have a slope of 1 through here. So it's really coming out of here, aiming at up 1 over 1. But then it wants to get more increased on the right side. So this thing is going to slip on this side of 1, and this side is going to go down forever. There's 1, 0, and it's close to, say, 0.8. I don't know if 0.8 is a great guess, but I know it's on this side of 1. Now, you could graph the calculator and you could say you could just based on inspection, or we could just create a T chart and and that's really old school how we would do this. Create a T chart of values and say, hey, I got a value close to one, or I got a value close to a half. Uh, so anyway, what do we need? We need the derivative. So here's f of x. We need the derivative. Here's f prime of x. F prime of x is three x squared plus one. And then we would say start with one or 0.8. And I'd put 0.8 in here. And I'd subtract f of 0.8. Well, f of 0.8, even with the keypad, it's a little bit cumbersome. And we're going to get a bunch of decimals here after we take 0.8 to the third. Find that. Take 3 times 0.8 squared plus 1. Find that. Divide those two. Round that. Subtract that from x to the n. Round that. Now we're getting some rounding here, but we're going to write lots of decimals. And now we got a new x n plus 1. And now we put that here and we do the process over until we really converge on a value. Now the good news is Newton's method is pretty convenient uh, or pretty quick. But what if it takes six iterations? We've got to go through that and go through that and go through that. Like I said, this is a huge hug your calculator moment. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to jump into y1 and I'm going to enter f. So that is x cubed, and while we're doing this, keep, keep, keep thinking of everything else we'd have to do, plus x minus 1. For f for y2, I'm going to enter the derivative. That is 3x squared plus 1. I'm done in here. I'm not graphing them. I could graph the first one and, and try to figure out a reasonable approximation, and we might come back and take a look at it after we go through Newton's method. Okay, so next we're going to quit out of here. And then I determine based on my drawing here that maybe 0.7, maybe 0.8. I'm going to choose 0.8. I'm going to have x1 equals 0.8. And so how we do that is we put in, let's clear this. I'm going to go 0.8. And now, I think I just entered 8. 0.8. And now this little store button right above on on your calculator I'm going to store that, gives me that little arrow, as x. I'm going to hit x. I didn't hit graph. It looked like I did because my finger covered the graph button. But I hit, just hit x. And it stores that and it tells me, OK, we know that x has been stored. It's 0.8. So what I want to do is with that is this formula right up here. I want to have x, my x chosen x value, minus f of x. That is vars my y variable, my first function, divided by the derivative. That's my second function I entered. So back to vars, y vars, function, y2. And now here's the really good news. I'm not going to have to enter that again. I go enter, and there's my first approximation. And if I'm just looking for it, I don't have to record this, but I'm going to record this. So x2 says, Hey, we're about 0.693151. And then I'm just going to hit Enter again. And I get, OK, my x3 value. We're, we're bypassing an awful lot of work right here that we'd have to do just punching numbers in. 0.693151. It's basically 1 here as well. I'm going to go one more time. 
enter, and now I'm just, we, you see we've locked in. In fact, by that time, we've locked in on a value. So it doesn't take long at all. So now that I've locked in at this rounded value, I'm going to say x is approximately 0 0.693151. Now I get it. We can get that from our, from our graphing calculator. But you wouldn't get these values along the way. So how this might be asked would be, hey, this has a 0 near 0 0.8. Use Newton's method. Show the approximations until you are accurate to six decimal places. All right, let's check it. Let's go back into y equals. I'm going to turn this off, this function off. Just hit enter there, and it will only graph this one. I'm going to zoom standard. And sure enough, there's our zero, kind of like we thought. I'm going to second count value. Nope, zero. Then I'm going to get just to the left, stamp this to the right, stamp, stamp again. And what do we get? 0.68. Well, that's not what my answer had. Y equals, let's see, what's my mistake here? 3x squared plus 1, that looks good. Now I'm scrambling a little bit here. Let's go back to, did I put a plus instead of a minus? Let's go back, second quit. Y1, my x value stored. I want to enter, enter. Oh, you know what? Nope, closing in. I had to keep closing in on it. I had to keep closing in. I thought my values were locked in. So here we go. Enter, enter. Okay, now we're locked in at. So eventually I get to my mistake there. I thought that we had values locked in. I get to point six eight two three two eight. Huh. Okay, um, my apologies there. We'll go through another example as well. Um, back into our graph though, and we can go back to second count zero. Let's let's double check that. Second count, second count zero. A little bit left, enter. A little bit right, enter, enter. Then I've got point six eight two three. Is it 2 or is it 7? Y equals second quit. It was 2, 8. Yep, 2, 7, 2, 8. So it rounds, it rounds right into there. Okay, so apologies there. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at B. For B, how am I going to use Newton's method if it's used to find zeros? Well, I'm going to treat this like x squared minus 2x plus 1 minus sine of x equals 0. And where does that cross zero? Well, we can create a t-chart and get an idea, but I'm going I'm to do a little cheating on this one. Let's go into y equals. Let's clear these both out. So our function we want to graph here is going to be x squared minus 2x plus 1 minus sine <coughs> of x. And the second function is that derivative, 2x minus 2, and derivative of sine is cosine, so minus cosine x. Okay, I'm going to quit out of here. In fact, before I quit out of there, I think I'm going to just graph that first one so I get a decent approximation. So turn the second one off. Let's go zoom standard again. Zoom standard 6. And we may have more than one zero here. Kind of wants to look like a parabola, just adjusted a little bit with this sign, which is going to be just adding and subtracting one. So basically, just looks like a parabola. It looks like <coughs> looks like I might have a good choice right here near about 0.3, and it looks like two might actually even just be a zero. Let's see, x2 is we're going to use two. I'm going to call it x1. This is my second x1 because we have two different zeros. So, second quit. We remember what to do. I'm going to clear it. I'm going to go to store that point 0.3. So, point 0.3, store it into x. It tells me it did. And now I can kind of cheat here a little bit. Second enter. Second enter. We got this guy. And I'm just taking a look at it. I'm going to do it more carefully this time. Three, eight, two, five, six, nine. Boy, we look like we are right on the money. No changing. So we've got, oh, that's what I did. 
That's what I did. I didn't store the new value. Here we go. So I bet some of you saw that if you were in class today. I'm going to start that all over. Um, and I'll bet, I'll bet that's what happened on the last one. Let me uh, clear this. Here's the deal. Let's start this again. Point three, store as x, enter. This is the biggie that I missed. I'm, I'll be interested to go back in the video and see if I missed that on the one before. Um, I'm going to go second, enter, second, enter. This I have to store as a new x value. And enter. Okay, now we're going to use this new value. I've just kept finding the same thing at point three. And now we find a new value. And now we find, okay, we're narrowing in on it. Oh, man, that's more comforting. And now we've got it. So let's see. Our, we ended up with dot, dot, dot. X is approximately, it's still just approximately, 0.386237. So, yes, we have to store that. Um, uh, pretty good news, though. In fact, uh, I'll show you, you don't even have to second enter. You can just keep entering if we've got that store X. So let's go back, for our, find our zero near two. So I've got, I may redo this video, but two store as X, enter. And now, second enter, second enter, I've got this. And now I can just do a sequence of just hit enters because I'm storing it back as X. Enter, I've got that. Enter, oh, that's what I, I guess that's probably what I was doing. Enter, and here we go. Um, we're, we're narrowing down. It looks like we got it to six places. Enter, and now we've got a complete match. So this would be approximately 1.961569, rounded to six decimal places. Okay, so um, a little clumsy there at the start on, on A. Hopefully you got it. Really a pretty simple process. I'm a little embarrassed that I missed it, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to move on. Okay, our third type of, of mechanics. So again, this is, this is discussed here, um, the, the calculator process. Our third is called just differentials, which of course comes from differentiation. But take a look. We typically get things like this, dy dx equals f prime of x. Well, yeah, we know that. We've been doing that for a while. It's just the derivative with respect to x. So all we do here is say, hey, dy dx, it's not a marriage. It's just this is a change of y. This is change of x. If I multiply this side by change of x, I get plain old dy. Well, that's pretty easy. Let's take a look. Compared to what we've been doing, this is light lifting here. So find dy. Well, I'm going to start with dy dx, just what we've always been doing. This is 3x squared minus 3. So dy is, maybe the only way you've missed this is, let's make sure we multiply dx by everything, 3x squared minus 3 dx. And now it says evaluate dy for x is 2 and dx is 0.05. You'll see where this comes into play when we get to a more real world problem on the back, what this is for. So that would be equals 3 times 2 squared minus 3 times 0.05. Or let's see, we get 4, 12 minus 3, 9 times 0.05. We get dy is 0.45. So what this means is, let's say just for a second this was a volume formula. It was a volume of something. It says when our volume goes from 2 to 2.05, or not when our volume, when, when the radius or something of our volume, some factor, when it changes by 0.05, that changes the whole volume by 0.45. So you'll see, you'll see, believe me, in the next few weeks, you're going to see plenty of real world examples where we'd use this, more so than probably anything we've done in the book so far. Okay, so same thing, start with dy dx, product rule, first times derivative of second, plus derivative of first times plain old second, or dy equals, this would become x plus 2x ln x dx. There's dy. That's our differential. So now we want x to be 1, dx to be 0.01. So dy is 1 plus 2 times 1 times ln 1 times 
just substituting values in. Doesn't get easier than that. Ln, that's the exponent that turns e into 1. This is 0. So if this is 0, I get 2 times 0, 0, plus 1, 1, times 0.01. It's just 0.01. dy is 0.01. That's it. And an actual beginning of a real world problem for this. Write a differential formula that estimates the given change in volume or surface area, depending on what the question is. Well, this is a volume one. Then use the formula to estimate the change when the independent variable changes from 10 to 10.05. The change in volume, that's D volume. We want D volume of a sphere. So here's our volume. When the radius changes from A to A plus DR, well, in that case, this is from 10 to 10.05. Okay, so dv must be finding changes when the radius changes, dr, equals, well, 4 thirds is a constant, pi is a constant. Don't get messed up with this and think we have to product rule this. This is just a constant times r to the third. So the 3 comes down, turns this into 4 pi r squared. Volume of a sphere's derivative actually happens to be the area, surface area of the sphere. You may not recall that, that formula, but that is it. So dv is 4 pi r squared dr. And we want change in volume. That speaks to me. That is dv. So I get 4 times pi times the radius was 10. The radius changed by 0.05. Oh, that's what we're doing with this. So when the radius changes on a, you can kind of see that as a radius changes on a sphere as it gets bigger and bigger, um, a little change in the, you know what, here's a perfect example. Now, I know this isn't a sphere, but let's talk about the area of your pizza. It, you know, we get a 12-inch pizza, and a 14-inch pizza costs way more than a 12-inch. Well, by the time I'm a 12-inch pizza and I go to 14, we're adding a lot of area. Same with televisions. We're like, hey, I've got a, I had a 20-inch diagonal television. Now I've got a 40-inch diagonal television, and it cost way more. Why didn't it just cost twice as much? Well, the area is way bigger. So we need to know what it was, what it changed by. So anyway, what do we get here? 100 times 4, 400 pi times 0.05, 400 times 0.05. I'm, uh, I'm not going to make another mistake on this video. So 400 times 0.05, a little embarrassed to do this, 400 times 0 0.05 is 20, 20 pi. Now, that is our change in volume, but 20 pi in a real world problem doesn't make any sense for volume. But it is volume. And when we're talking volume, we're talking cubic units. And in this case, we're talk talking centimeters cubed. So that is it compared to what we've been doing in 5.4. Wow, welcome relief, but very, very foundational to what we're going to be doing moving forward. Here's a look at your assignment, and I do not think that this should be as taxing as some we have done. So let's get after it, and good luck.